Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for joining uh, as part of the CECAS webinar LGBTQ plus series. Um, we are so excited that you are joining us again. We are now day three of the webinar series. Uh, today, we were focusing on risk and protective factors for LGBTQ plus young people, implications of COVID and beyond. Uh, I'm incredibly excited about our um, wonderful speakers today. Um, a lot, we will, you know, dive into some of the implications around mental health, talk about um, GSAs. Uh, friendly reminder for folks in this webinar, uh, you will not be able to see yourself or um, speak, and we won't be able to hear you. If you do speak, you are muted and your camera has been turned off. Um, if you want to chat, um, elevate something that was really great that you heard in the webinar, feel free to use a chat box. If you do have a question that you would like answered, if you could use the question and answer feature of the Zoom platform that allows us to really keep the chat um, free for us to share all the wonderful information that we're learning. But for the webinar, if you'll use the question and answer feature, that will allow it and make sure that you get your question answered. Um, so without um, saying, I'm gonna actually let my speakers introduce themselves um, at once they uh, present. I think the best person to tell who you are is yourself. Um, and so I'm gonna allow that they um, share their, their names, their pronouns, their brilliance, all of their information as they, they jump in. So I'm gonna come off camera because I am not gonna be the one speaking and I will um, pass the controls to our first speaker. Take it away. Apologies. I will go ahead and introduce Dr. Uh, Maisha Pricevini, who is our first speaker for today. Um, I will now hand it off to you. Okay, can everyone hear me? I'm having, I, something happened with my, my view of my Zoom, and I cannot see the presentation and the video at the same time. So I just see the presentation for now, and we're good. Um, yeah, we can hear you. I can't see your faces. <laughs> um, um, so I'll start off by saying, um, see, let me try to advance the slide. Uh, no. There you go. There you go. Um, so I'm Aisha Pricebini. I use she, her pronouns. Um, I'm a research scientist at the Trevor Project. And I came to the Trevor Project, um, oh, one too many slides. Uh, we'll leave it there for now. <laughs> and then I'm also happy to take over and just advance for you if that's easier. Yeah, I don't, something happened. I think I maybe clicked somewhere, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> we can just go back one. Um, <laughs> Uh, uh, yeah, so um, I came to the Trevor Project, sorry, start over. Um, I'm Maisha Price Meany, I use she, her pronouns. I came um, research scientist at the Trevor Project. I came here in March 2019 um, to help support the endeavors of our research department, which was established in 2018 and is headed by Dr. Amy Green. And so prior to this, I was a at a tenure track position. Um, I also had um, a role as a postdoctoral research associate at a small research nonprofit. Um, I like to also add that I'm a develop, developmental psychologist by training, because I think that um, impacts a lot of the work that I do. Uh, so next slide. <clears throat> All right, so next slide. Actually, if you try, it may let you do it now. Okay, cool. Let's see if I can, I can't, I don't know what happened nope. on my view. Yeah. Don't worry, I like, will. Okay. Nope, <laughs> did I do that? Or did you may have it's fine i will do it from here on out i'm sorry <laughs> um so here's an overview of what we're going to talk about today um, i'm going to do a brief overview of trevor project for those of you who haven't heard of us um, or refresher for those who have um, i'll also provide some framing um, of an uh, overview of lgbtq um, youth mental health overall um, then i'll discuss some specific implications of COVID 19 for lgbtq youth mental health um, and at the end, I'm hoping to get into some questions or comments that you all may have. Okay. 
Um, so, like I mentioned, this is a, um, primarily for those of, you, well, those of you who haven't heard of Trevor. Um, so we're the world's largest suicide and crisis intervention organization for lesbian, gay, bisexual, and transgender, queer, and questioning young people. Um, so those of you who are familiar with Trevor are likely most aware of our suite of crisis services platforms, which includes Trevor Lifeline, Trevor Chat, um, Trevor and Trevor Text, which allows youth to reach out um, to us 24 seven using phone, texting, and web chat. We also have Safe Space online social networking platform for LGBTQ youth and Trevor Space, which allows LGBTQ youth around the globe to connect with one another. And so to support our mission of ending suicide among LGBTQ young people, we also have an education department um, to, to provide others with training and skills they need to best support LGBTQ youth and prevent suicide. And our advocacy department um, works with LGBTQ inclusive policies impacting youth and also um, works to stop policies that can harm youth. And then of course we have our research department. Um, so next slide please. Um, so the mission of our research department is to produce um, and use innovative research that brings new knowledge and clinical implications of the field of suicidology and LGBTQ youth mental health. So we approach this large mission in three main ways. The first part is by advancing scientific inquiry. And so as a past academic researcher, this is the one that fits that most overlaps with the work that I've done in the past. Um, and so it involves conducting studies and publica publishing data to help advance our understanding of ways to prevent suicide among LGBTQ youth. Um, so our research team also um, works to use our data and that of the broader field to help advance Trevor's crisis services and also Trevor space programs, um, and as well as to inform our, our, our advocacy and education teams. And that's because we would like, our goal is to make sure that everything that we do at Trevor is evidence informed. Um, we also want to make sure that our uh, research at Trevor is shared with the broader community. And so that's why presentations such as this one, where presentations such as this one kind of fit in. And so one of the most exciting parts about working at Trevor, uh, specifically for me, um, who came from an academic background and didn't often get the opportunity to do, opportunity to do things like this, um, is knowing that the, Trevor, the research at Trevor is going to be shared with not just academic audiences, but with the variety of organizations and stakeholders um, working to support LGBTQ youth. Um, so next, I'm going to give you a bit of an overview of the guiding of a, some guiding frameworks for understanding um, risk and protective factors for LGBTQ youth mental health, um, and also things that um, guide our work here at the Trevor Project. Um, great. So um, we all know, well, I guess we don't know, but LGBTQ youth experience higher rates of negative mental health outcomes. And so, for example, nationwide prevalence data from the Centers for Disease Control and Mental Health, um, sorry, Disease Control and Prevention um, reveal that 24% of LGB high school students report attempting suicide, um, which is more than four times the rate of non-LGB high school students. So we also know that this disparity isn't because of something related to being LGBTQ in and of itself. The minority stress framework suggests that it, it's instead related to the way LGBTQ youth are treated. So essentially, it's the marginalized place that they hold in society. So in other words, higher rates of suicide result from increased internalized stigma experienced by youth. Um, this comes from experiences of discrimination, victimization, and rejection from others. And um, all of these can be considered risk factors for suicide. So these can be actual experiences or just the expectation that, they're ha that they will happen. And we also know that um, minority stress may be more impactful for youth who occupy multiple marginalized identities. So this can mean youth who are both transgender and queer or youth who are um, both LGBTQ and black, for example. So on the other side of these risk factors, we have protective factors, which can be understood through a resiliency framework. And so this framework suggests that protective factors are um, such as support from other social support, um, LGBTQ role models and inclusive policies can provide a buffer against these risk, fa risk factors and it's increased resiliency in LGBTQ youth. Um, so while existing research points to a variety of risk factors um, for in that increase, L increase youth vulnerability uh, for experiencing these negative mental health outcomes, we also know that there are some protective factors that support LGBTQ youth 
in ways that reduce their risk. So both risk and protective factors um, impact LGBTQ youth mental health. And we can view COVID-19 as increasing many of these risk factors. Um, and so we also have to consider ways that we can ensure that we buffer these risk factors with protective factors for LGBTQ youth. Okay, so um, next I'm gonna walk you through some of the specific implications of COVID-19 for LGBTQ youth mental health. So I'm gonna present how uh, COVID-19 can increase these negative um, health mental health challenges for LGBTQ youth. And then because I think it's important um, to not just simply present a problem without a potential solution, I'm then gonna provide some suggestions for how we might go about addressing them. Um, so although young um, youth and young adults are estimated to have a lower mortality rate um, from COVID-19, they're not immune to its consequences. And they're certainly not immune um, to things as it relates to the mental health and well-being um, related to COVID-19. So with LGBTQ youth being at already at an increased risk for poor mental health outcomes, as we already went over, um, they may be particularly vulnerable for the negative mental health impacts associated with COVID-19. Um, there's so many possible implications for COVID-19, how COVID-19 might impact LGBTQ youth mental health, and likely several that I won't be covering today. Um, however, the ones I will cover come from our white paper that we released in early April. And those are gonna, in there, I'm gonna outline um, ways that physical distancing, economic strain, and increased anxiety um, related to COVID-19 might disparately impact LGBTQ youth. Okay, next slide. Uh, so starting off with physical distancing. Um, so one of the unintended consequences of physical, physical distancing, which is commonly referred to as social distancing, um, and what I think is a tragic PR um, incident on, on behalf of whoever's in charge of COVID-19 public relations um, is the potential loss of social connections that um, protect LGBTQ youth from suicidality. So from a developmental perspective, uh, loneliness is especially relevant for youth populations. And as the need for social acceptance and belongingness is prominent during adolescence and young adulthood, uh, so although it's a little too early for us to fully understand the impact of, of physical distancing due to COVID-19 um, on health and mental health, physical health and mental health, um, existing research um, has found that people who don't feel connected to others might um, are more likely to suffer from respiratory illness, um, re report, they're more likely to report depression and anxiety, and, and to experience suicidality. So in line with the interpersonal um, theory of suicide, connection to others can fulfill youth's need to belong, thereby reducing the risk for suicide. And so therefore uh, social connection can actually become a crucial component to suicide um, prevention. So among LGBTQ individuals in particular, connection to the LGBTQ, LGBTQ community um, has been found to buffer the impact of social uh, stigma on depression and suicidality. Um, so in order to address this potential negative social um, impacts of physical distancing, um, efforts have to be made to ensure that LGBTQ youth know that they're not alone and feel encouraged to seek support and social connections through means that don't rely specifically on physical proximity. Uh, so physical distancing, essentially physical distancing does not equate social isolation, right? Uh, so there's already a thriving online um, LGBTQ community that allows um, youth to Experience, experience connections to others. LGBTQ youth um, should also be encouraged to maintain existing connections virtually, such as the video calls and video conferencing, or participating in shared activities such as like online gaming, watch parties, or even uh, physical activity classes that are happening online. Um, LGBTQ Q youth may also lose access to um, positive connections. Um, like extracurricular activities as a result of school closings. closings. Um, so in addition to the educational opportunities that schools provide, um, they also provide involvement in, in um, sports, clubs, and um, access to supportive adults, um, such as teachers, coaches, counselors, and specifically for LGBTQ youth, they also may offer um, access to 
an LGBTQ community, such as a GSA or connections to counselors and mental health uh, resources. Um, so how do we address this loss? I think it's important for schools to continue, um, as schools continue to move academic curriculum online or adapt to these new realities of COVID-19, um, there's a need to ensure that protective factors provided by schools, such as these um, supportive individuals and extracurricular activities um, should be provided vir uh, virtually. They should be able to be accessed to virtu uh, virtually. Um, teachers and health professionals in schools um, should also make their office hours available uh, to students um, to provide support to students. Um, and schools should um, work to ensure that opportunities such as GSA involvement are involvement um, are available to students virtually when school is actually in session again. Okay, so next slide. Um, related to physical distancing as well, um, many LGBTQ youth may find themselves confined in places um, that's unsupportive of their sexual orientation or gender identity for an indefinite amount of time. Another a PR snafu um, arguably is the safer at home <laughs> uh, line that, that we were all being told. Some people just are not safer at home. Um, and so this is arguably, this may arguably be the case for LGBTQ youth. Um, LGB young adults who report high levels of parental rejection are eight times more likely to report attempted suicide and six times more likely to report high levels of depression. Um, unsupportive environments may result in increased dysphoria, particularly among transgender and, um, and non-binary youth um, who may have to hide their authentic selves in order to maintain their safety. Um, also, intimate partner violence is more prevalent among, um, in the LGBTQ community, even among youth and young adults. So there may also be, there's also uh, less opportunities for mandated reporters and other concerned indi individuals to see these signs of potential abuse and violence. Um, so again, what, what can we do? Um, youth who find themselves in an environment that doesn't affirm their identity or places them at risk for abuse and victimization can really benefit from access to supportive individuals to help them maintain their safety while also providing an outlet for them uh, to be their authentic selves. Our own research at Trevor shows that youth who have at least one supportive adult were 40% less likely to report a suicide attempt in the past year. And so youth who, um, youth can seek out these connections either through existing support networks or by joining online, online spaces for LGBTQ youth. Um, those in direct contact with LGBTQ youth, such as through organ, uh, youth serving organizations, um, counselors, uh, individuals who um, come in contact with youth through um, their schools um, can ask whether they feel ask youth whether they feel safe and supported in their current living situation. Additionally, public information about COVID nineteen, so all the things that tell you what to do and how to cope with COVID, should include information, uh, contact information for national domestic. Um, Hot, national domestic abuse hotlines, and information on how to access um, state abuse, state child abuse, um, and neglect hotlines as well. Okay. So we know that increased unemployment rates are occurring across the country as a result of COVID-19. Um, and so with these, um, with the unemployment rates, there are concerns um, about the impacts that it'll have on mental health and suicidality particularly among vulnerable, vulnerable populations such as LGBTQ youth. So experts from the United Nations International Labor Organizations are predicting a rise in global unemployment due to COVID-19. And these economic downturns and recessions have been found to be related to increased increases in rates of suicide mortality and negative mental health among young people. These impacts are especially pronounced among LGBTQ populations who experience both higher rates of unemployment and higher rates of suicidality, particularly among those who identify as transgender or non-binary and LGBTQ youth of color. So again, what can we do? 
Unemployment resources and mental health services can help reduce risk for suicidality, even during times of global economic strain. We know this because of previous research that's been done um, related to the Great Recession and other countries um, that provided resources for individuals. Further, while LGBTQ youth are now, LGBTQ youth are now, as of just one week ago, um, protected from discrimination related to sexual orientation, non-discrimination policies related to gender identity, particularly, um, can also facilitate unemployment opportunities, um, facil facilitate employment opportunities uh, for LGBTQ youth. Um, so economic strains can also lead to um, substantial increases in housing instability. Even before the spread of coronavirus, LGBTQ youth were overrepresented um, at twice the overall rate of youth reports of unstable housing. And LGBTQ youth who experienced housing instability were twice as likely to report seriously considering suicide and three times more likely to report attempting suicide compared to LGBTQ youth who had not. Um, so policy changes, social support, and attention to mental health might mitigate these impacts of housing instability as they relate to COVID-19 for LGBTQ youth. From a policy perspective, we've already heard this from other people, but moratoriums on evictions and rent freezes during this pandemic can really help um, those experiencing economic strain and main to maintain um, safe shelter and also in turn to reduce risk for suicidality. Um, Additionally, organizations serving LGBTQ youth um, should be cognizant about the impact of housing instability, as, as well as um, ensuring that LGBTQ youth are supported now more than ever. There's also, on the flip side, organizations that serve um, individuals who may be experiencing housing instability should ensure that their staff and services, um, their staff and the services they're provided are LGBTQ affirming to reduce barriers for LGBTQ youth in, access, in accessing these services and resources. So youth may be experiencing increased anxiety. And so some of these may be related to the very present um, nature of, the, of coronavirus in terms of um, oneself or a loved one contracting the virus, particularly among those with pre-existing conditions, such as asthma or those who are immunocompromised. Um, health anxiety was already presumed to be on the rise in recent decades uh, due to a combination of rises in general anxiety, as well as access to health information, constant access to health information over the internet and 24-hour and, uh, news. Um, so a pandemic health event, such as the spread of coronavirus, um, likely further exacerbates um, health anxiety in people and further due to high rates of discrimination in the healthcare system and experiences with non-affirming care LGBTQ individuals may experience anxiety about having to um, seek medical attention even if they are experiencing symptoms of COVID-19. Um, so there's a need for services that allow um, LGBTQ youth to discuss their anxieties with individuals um, that can provide them with social support and assist them with exploring ways that they'll be able to um, access additional resources. With LGBTQ youth already um, being at increased risk for anxiety disorders, it's, it's imperative to work to prevent um, increases in mental health conditions resulting from this pandemic. Uh, the COVID-19 pandemic is likely um, to result in decreased physical access to individuals trained in mental health and suicide prevention. And as such, um, LGBTQ youth need to be able to access remote support through telehealth as well as phone and digital based uh, crisis services. So in addition to feeling concerned about the present, youth may also be experiencing anxieties related to, future, um, to the future. And those can be related to school, uh, future relationships or paths to future goals and aspirations. So these feelings um, of anxiety related to changes might already be present in youth, but the COVID-19 pandemic has the potential to exacerbate them, um, those that were already pre present, or to introduce new concerns for youth, specifically LGBTQ minors who may not be in supportive environments and have been waiting until they graduate high school or become a legal age to move out or to move to more supportive environments, perhaps uh, for school or work, they might be feeling like 
the pandemic has halted or postponed their ability to, to literally live as or embrace their true authentic selves. Um, so as with the struggles of the present, it's important that LGBTQ youth who are experiencing increased anxieties about the future during this time um, have access to individuals with whom they can discuss their concerns and struggles um, and that can help alleviate, alleviate some of these anxieties for them. Um, these individuals can support youth, um, not only in helping them adjust to the possibility of a new time frame and what that can mean for them, but also um, in their LGBTQ identity. Um, youth may find it particularly helpful to utilize online communities uh, through which they can feel more open to trying out their LGBTQ identity um, if they're not able to do so in their current environment. And one study even found that LGBTQ youth were able to find increased comfort in their identities, even through watching others' journeys on, on, online um, and that the internet supported their coming out process um, by often being the first place they were able to do so. So that would be a great resource for them. So I, I kind of already alluded to the uh, mental health care, but I want to um, talk a little bit more about this and that we know that um, providing LGBTQ youth mental health care during this time is an important protective factor, um, but COVID-19 is likely to prevent some of this from happening. Um, even before COVID-19, LGBTQ youth um, who were reported seriously considering suicide in the past year did not receive uh, mental health care. This was particularly true for Black LGBTQ youth. Um, who were less likely to um, receive mental health care despite um, reporting, um, beside, despite being just as likely to report being seriously um, considering suicide. So under the conditions of COVID-19, um, LGBTQ youth may lose access to mental health care that they may be getting through schools, um, through office closures, job loss, stay-at-home orders, or other scenarios uh, that may just further exacerbate this issue that already existed. Um, that said, the flip side is that uh, we know that COVID-19 has potential to break down some of the traditional barriers to care by providing therapy privately in individuals' home locations. So as providers begin to rethink how care is provided during COVID-19 using technological advances in telehealth, um, we hope that they can better, that we can um, better understand this mental health gap, mental health care gap, and how these services can be expanded beyond the current pandemic to better serve LGBTQ youth and perhaps reduce some of these barriers to care that we see. Okay, so that leads me into um, some conclusions, recommendations, and hopefully we'll have a little bit of time for questions after um, the next talk, I believe is how that will go. Uh, so conclusions are, next slide. Um, overall, there are already existing disparities in mental health between LGBTQ youth and their straight and cisgender peers. COVID-19 is exacerbate, exacerbating, increasing, making worse the already existing, uh, the already challenging experiences that many youth, um, honestly many youth, including youth of color, economically disadvantaged, and in this case LGBTQ youth are having in the United States. Um, by specifically addressing these underlying inequalities, inequities, uh, many of the implications of COVID-19 on mental health outcomes can be thwarted. Further, given the very real and significant physical risk associated with pandemics, it's often not until well after disease containment that mental health and psychological service programs, psychological support programs, sorry, uh, begin to be prioritized. However, it's important to act early in the prevention of lasting mental health outcomes. Uh, rates of suicide, depression, anxiety, and other mental health outcomes are already at increased rates among LGBTQ youth. So it's important to act early. The Trevor Project is uniquely positioned uh, to provide a range of support to LGBTQ youth through this pandemic. All our services were already existing uh, online and 24-7 including uh, LGBT peer, LGBTQ peer support community in Trevor Space, our uh, trained crisis services counselors, and we also had support resources, again, all available 24 seven. So what we're hoping is that others will join us in helping LGBTQ youth know that they're not alone and provide the social, economic, and mental health support that they need during these um, un 
unprecedented times. And that's all I have for now. Thank you so much, Dr. Freeney, um, Price Feeney. We are going to um, hold questions to the end yeah. so that we make sure that our next speaker has um, enough time. Uh, just a friendly reminder, this webinar is being recorded. All of the resources, webinar slides will be available online. So with that, I'm going to offer up our next speaker. Um, and actually, Paul, I'm going to ask for you to take control of the screen and see if that will work for you. Okay, thank you, Jennifer. Um, I'm Paul Petit. My pronouns are he, him, his. And I just want to start by thanking Jennifer and Noel for this opportunity to be here virtually with you all today and also to be able to present alongside Maisha on such a critical topic. Um, I am a professor at Boston College and the uh, School of Education and Human Development, and I'm very fortunate to be able to work with some wonderful colleagues here and uh, throughout the US and addressing issues related to uh, LGBTQ youth's experiences in schools and with a particular focus on gender sexuality alliances, which I'll be talking about today. And uh, hopefully building a bit on what Maisha just shared and focusing it uh, particularly to the school context and so I'm going to try to see if I can take over the screen, but I'm not sure, Jennifer, is there something that I need to click on? I think if you just hit next or the arrow, it may advance on your own. Hmm. That did not work. All right. Fun times there. I will try to advance some for you. I can, Sorry about that. I can, if it might be easier, I could share my screen and use the Oh, yes, that would work or as well, so I will stop sharing my Okay, let me see if I can do that. And then is my screen showing? Hopefully. Nope, if you click on share at the bottom of the Zoom. Oh, okay. Your screen. perfect. Um, how is that? Is that better? It's coming. Yep, there it is. Okay, and still there? Still there, you're good oh, to go, thank you. I'm, I'm batting a perfect 100 rarity here for my technology skills. So uh, as we're talking about LGBTQ youth health during pandemics and focusing on how GSAs might play a critical role in fostering LGBTQ youth's resilience at this time, I think it's important for us to consider the um, pandemic of COVID-19 um, within a longer historical context, and in particular to really acknowledge and recognize that many LGBTQ youth are facing multiple pandemics, many that have long preceded COVID-19. In general, we still see that the majority of LGBTQ youth are experiencing bullying and harassment at school and that while this has decreased somewhat in the past 20 years, we do still see disparities in this uh, compared to heterosexual cisgender youth at school. And we also are very much aware, particularly in this moment, about pandemics of racism and xenophobia, which impact a number of LGBTQ youth of color, as well as immigrant LGBTQ youth. And finally, we see that in schools, as well as in the larger juvenile justice system, disparities in school discipline and what many scholars uh, call school pushout, where we see that LGBTQ youth often face uh, more extreme forms of discipline uh, for particular infractions at school, such as substance use or absenteeism. Um, and so we see a confluence of pandemics at this moment that are impacting LGBTQ youth's health. And I bring these up because as Maisha was just saying, all of these have the potential to be magnified in the current context of COVID-19. It's been well documented that there are racial and economic and gender disparities in access to healthcare. We see this now 
um, in the data showing disparities in how COVID-19 is spreading and how healthcare is accessible to many uh, communities of color in particular. And we also see for LGBTQ youth, they're experiencing unique stressors and challenges uh, during this period. For example, a number of LGBTQ youth are reporting recloseting during uh, this quarantine period where they may not feel safe at home with uh, their parents or siblings. And so while some LGBTQ youth may have been out prior to COVID-19, uh, they're intentionally holding back that part of their identity out of uh, uh, safety concerns. We also know that while LGBTQ youth experience harassment and victimization at school, they also have the potential to experience this in virtual spaces. And as many schools are shifting to remote instruction, it's important for us to be aware of that where LGBTQ youth are using online spaces and social media for many things, whether that's to socialize and to maintain connection with their peers, uh, to access instruction um, and learning. And in those spaces, there is potential for them to face harassment which might be more difficult for teachers and other adults in schools um, to see or be aware of. And so we need to be intentional uh, in, in observing that or, or um, addressing it. The reason why it's important to focus on schools in times of pandemics is because we know that historically schools do play critical roles in meeting needs of uh, children, youth, and families in times of crisis and many different types of crises. And with the current COVID-19 pandemic, and as schools look ahead toward even the next school year, uh, we need to remain aware that uh, students will be experiencing enduring trauma from these past four months and through the summer. Uh, many youth and their families may be experiencing food and housing insecurity. And in fact, even prior to COVID-19, there's research that shows that LGBTQ youth are disproportionately represented among uh, youth who are experiencing housing insecurity or homelessness. We also know that because of the current conditions in COVID-19, that this is limited access to other in-person community resources for LGBTQ youth where they've been able to um, previously access support from adults and uh, affirming peers. When we think about the school context, oftentimes for many of us, we naturally would assume that schools are a source of adversity for LGBTQ youth. And certainly that is where many LGBTQ youth experience much of the discrimination that they report, whether from peers or other adults in schools. And yet at the same time, there's a tension because we also know that schools are a place that provides supports and resources for LGBTQ youth. And it's encouraging to know, for example, from one of the more recent GLSEN uh, National School Climate Surveys that uh, over 90% of LGBTQ students can identify a supportive adult at school and well over half can identify more than six. And so we need to also recognize and draw from those sources of strength, particularly during pandemics, because we know essentially that LGBTQ youth are resilient and they thrive when they are in schools that are affirming and that support them. And so the question then arises, what can schools do? And admittedly, this is going to be a catch-all slide, an omnibus slide, to uh, try and share some of those things that schools can do, uh, while recognizing that for most of this presentation, I'll be focusing on GSAs, but I, I want to really show how GSAs are kind of situated within this larger network in schools and uh, fit within a larger a uh, number of resources and policies and practices uh, that can 
uh, provide much needed to, uh, support. And in the uh, end of this presentation, um, I included a number of links to resources and policies uh, if you're interested in seeing some examples of these. But we can think about, for example, policies and supportive resources at schools that are important, enumerated protective policies, so for example, anti-bullying and anti-discrimination policies that extend explicit protection to LGBTQ youth and other youth populations who historically have disproportionately experienced victimization and bullying and harassment at school, find that youth in schools with enumerated policies report a better sense of safety and lower victimization than youth in schools that have anti-bullying policies, but that aren't enumerated. And so enumeration is key. We also see uh, benefits of inclusive curricula where youth in schools who uh, are using curricula that represent LGBTQ individuals and issues are reporting better safety, lower truancy. Also providing ongoing professional development, especially in these times where we're seeing um, unique stressors and challenges faced by LGBTQ youth and other marginalized populations. It's important for school personnel to know what those needs may be and how they can best support youth in this time. And what I'll be focusing on in just a bit are LGBTQ affirming school clubs as another resource. So those could be considered supportive resources and policies. We can also think about this in terms of relationships and interactions between youth and their peers, youth and adults. It's important for us to constantly be ensuring respectful and affirming interaction norms as, as schools are transitioning to remote instruction. We also have to think about how do we cultivate affirming norms in virtual educational context as well. How do we maintain supportive adult connections even if they may not be in person? So how can we ensure that those safe and affirming supportive adults that LGBTQ youth are saying they have at school uh, can maintain a connection with those youth? And finally, how can schools partner with LGBTQ plus affirming uh, groups, whether those are virtual groups or groups in the local community, um, so that we have comprehensive support and services that we can connect youth with. I know that's a lot. And so since we do have some limited time, I'll focus today on these LGBTQ plus affirming school clubs. And like I said, uh, links to a number of these other resources are toward the end of this presentation that you can check out. When we think about LGBTQ plus supportive clubs, we can think about how they may be situated within uh, the larger field of extracurricular groups and school clubs. And we know from the general literature that extracurricular groups have strong potential to promote healthy development in youth. And yet, there's been much more limited attention to LGBTQ youth. What are the experiences of LGBTQ youth in school clubs and extracurricular groups? How do LGBTQ plus groups themselves function and promote uh, better outcomes for youth? One exception to this has been some research that's been conducted on gender and sexuality alliances, or as many others might know them as uh, gay-straight alliances historically. Uh, but we can think about GSAs and GSA comparable um, groups in schools and how they're a key setting to really provide targeted support and tailored resources to LGBTQ plus youth and their allies. And one of the things that we want to know is how do they do that? And what can we do to really maximize their benefits and their potential to promote resilience among LGBTQ plus youth? Some of you on the call today may have a GSA at your school. You might be aware of GSAs, but some of the first questions that might pop up for many of us might be, what do GSAs do? 
And how many are there in the US? Probably one of the first things we think about what GSAs do is their support function. We think that GSAs are there to support LGBTQ plus youth. Uh, and that is a major aim for many GSAs. They also provide a number of other things to youth members, including information and resources. It might be a space for youth to talk about LGBTQ plus issues in a way that's in greater depth than they can in some of their classes and to, with their peers. They can receive you know, trusted referrals to community agencies and online networks from their adult advisors or other peers. And a number of GSAs also engage in advocacy where they're able to directly counteract instances of discrimination in their school, or they might form coalitions with other diversity groups in the school to address issues of oppression more broadly and with an intersectional lens. And so you can see that GSAs really do have multiple aims and aspirations for youth. And so youth join GSAs likewise for different reasons. Some youth join GSAs because they are seeking support. Others are joining GSAs because they simply want to have a place to hang out and connect and make friends with people who they know are safe and affirming. And others are joining GSAs because they do want to engage in advocacy and to address issues of oppression, whether that's directly in their school or in their surrounding community. The most recent data from the CDC now show that GSAs and LGBTQ plus supportive clubs in general are now in roughly 38% of middle schools and high schools in the US. And that's a number that's grown quite significantly just in the past 10 years. At the same time, that does vary from state to state, as you might imagine. Um, ranges from about 14% of uh, secondary schools in Mississippi to 72% of secondary schools in Rhode Island. And so if you're interested in how many GSAs are in your state, uh, I, I'll include a link at the end to the report the CDC made and it breaks it down by state. You can kind of see uh, where that falls. Most of the research on GSAs has really focused on GSA presence and showing how youth in schools with GSAs do tend to report greater well-being than youth in schools without GSAs. And this was a, a very important foundational step because it really gets to the issue of access. And historically, access to GSAs has been contested uh, quite consistently uh, by groups who uh, are against having GSAs in schools. And so it was important as a foundational element to show that GSA access it could be important for many LGBTQ youth, as well as heterosexual cisgender youth. But moving beyond this, there's some important questions that we need to address. And one of those questions might be, what are the mental health needs of GSA members? Again, some members do join because they need uh, and seek support. Others are joining for advocacy. Others uh, would like to give support. And how do GSAs actually promote mental health? We know that their presence is important, but that doesn't really tell us too much about what they're doing or how they're actually promoting resilience among youth. And that information would be helpful if we're able to identify best practices for GSAs to really enhance these effects. And so I'd like to present some data that we had gathered recently in the past couple of years from about 38 GSAs across the state of Massachusetts um, to address some of these questions. And first question that we were interested in was simply, you know, what's the prevalence of mental health needs among GSA members? And so we not only worked with the GSAs, but also a set of four classrooms in each of these schools to see what just in general, the uh, prevalence of mental health concerns may be um, in the school relative to GSAs. We found that the percentage of 
youth in classes in these schools that uh, met the threshold for probable mild depression was 35%. That's contrasted to about 70% for youth and GSAs. So we asked youth and GSAs to fill out a measure um, that's been established and widely used for uh, depression. And we found that 70% of GSA members met that threshold that would indicate probable mild depression. So about twice as many uh, relative to kind of the general student population found similar results for anxiety, where youth in the classrooms in these schools, uh, among them, 19% uh, met that threshold for what would be considered moderate or concerning levels of anxiety. Whereas among GSA members, 62% were meeting that threshold for moderate or concerning anxiety. And so these data are really showing a clear need for uh, working with youth in GSAs, ensuring that the support that we're providing is um, culturally sensitive and tailored to the unique needs that many of the, their members are experiencing. Um, it may be indicative that in addition to providing support through GSAs, GSA advisors may be able to provide referrals to health professionals, uh, whether those health professionals may be in the school or outside in the community. We were also interested to build on that to also see what the GSA may be doing to address those mental health needs and uh, through what processes being involved in a GSA may help to reduce mental health concerns. And we know that GSAs themselves are not intended to be uh, group therapy sessions, even though a number of adult advisors might be their school psychologist or school counselor, or mental health counselor, guidance counselor. Um, but we know that they aren't mental health providers specifically. But we did feel, we believed that greater engagement in GSAs could nonetheless predict reduced mental health concerns through a process of empowerment. I want to pause here for a moment because I'm sure that most, if not all of us on this call have uh, thought of the word empowerment. We've heard empowerment and about its importance. But we might want to just pause to ask ourselves, what is empowerment? It's a rather abstract and broad concept. It's a powerful concept. And so it's important for us to really kind of break it down into its elements so that we know what constitutes empowerment? How can we really work on those specific elements to really boost it? And it isn't quite as overwhelming um, whenever we can make it a little more concrete. And so in the psychological literature, there's been a lot of work on empowerment and trying to define empowerment. Is empowerment an outcome? Is it a process? Do we see empowerment as this process and how people are able to live? It can be both. Uh, but in general, if we want to kind of distill it down to its essence, uh, we can think of empowerment as when someone has this gained sense of comp confidence, a greater sense of agency in their life and a sense of control and ability to set and achieve goals and pursue aspirations that are important to them. That's, how, that's one way that we can define empowerment. We can also think of empowerment along several different dimensions, like relational empowerment. And I want to call this one out because when we talk to youth, and scholars have talked to youth and asked them about their sense of empowerment and what types of empowerment are important to them, they often say that relational empowerment is especially important. And relational empowerment, for example, can be a sense of solidarity with your peers, being able to build coalitions and stand together through adversities and oppression. Uh, so I really wanted to just kind of highlight that one. So in looking at this, we thought that GSA engagement could predict reduced mental health concerns through this process of empowerment. And we looked at it on, in three different ways. We looked at a sense of peer validation. So you can imagine for many LGBTQ youth who are experiencing oppression and marginalization and stigma, um, it's important to feel validated and by your peers. We also looked at their sense of self-efficacy to promote social justice. 
we weren't interested just in a general sense of self-efficacy and confidence. We wanted to really see how they felt efficacious in addressing issues of oppression and marginalization. And finally, we were interested in hope, which I'll come back to um, in just a bit. And what we found whenever we followed GSA members over the course of the school year, we found that youth who were more engaged in their GSA over the course of the year later went on to report relative increases in their sense of peer validation, their efficacy to promote social justice, and their sense of hope. And I think I would argue that these in and of themselves are important outcomes and they underscore the importance of GSAs, that GSAs can be a source of empowerment to promote youth sense of empowerment. Adding to this, we also found that for hope in particular, youth who reported a relative increase in hope at the end of the school year reported reduced levels of depression and anxiety. And what I want to highlight from this is that there was this connection between greater engagement in GSA and lower mental health concerns through this increased sense of hope. And so through hope, GSA engagement predicted lower depressive and anxiety symptoms. And similar to empowerment, hope is a concept that I imagine all of us on the call have heard uh, and recognize as being vital throughout our lives. And yet, like empowerment, it's a broad, abstract concept that's also very powerful. And so it's important for us to be able to understand what could it mean? Because if we have a concrete understanding of what it means, that can enable us to really uh, build it up even more. So in the psychological literature, we can see that hope is defined as a belief that you're able to pursue and achieve your goals with the knowledge of how to do so. I want to point a couple of things out about this definition. One is it's, it's not simply having an optimistic outlook on the future or having kind of a passive sense of positivity about the future. It's much more active. I have clear goals and aspirations that I can define. I feel capable of being able to reach them and I know how to do that. So there are some clear components of hope that we can really uh, connect with and work to enhance. And so what I would say the take home point of this is that, you know, as we're partnering with LGBTQ youth in this time, in these times especially, how do we partner with them to identify what their goals are? What are their goals? It might be goals for this week. It might be goals for the next several years, but what are those goals? But don't just end there. How do we also partner with them to illuminate the pathways to those goals? Now that we've identified what those goals are, how, how do we work toward them? And how do we amplify their abilities to engage in action? Once they know the paths that there could be to get to these goals, how do we support them along the way? And, and amplify their ability to take leadership in that process. So I'll pause there. For more information, please feel free to contact me. And as I mentioned, um, there's a number of resources at the end and links that um, can follow up on this. Wonderful. Thank you both. Uh, we will open it up for Q&A. And just a reminder for folks, if you um, check your questions in the Q&A feature, we can answer um, them right away. So let's get started. So the first one is for you, Dr. Price Feeney. Um, the question is, thank you for your presentation. Do you have any recommendations for how to navigate LGBTQ plus students confidentiality and implementation of protective factors during distance learning for LGBTQ students who may be left out of school, um, but not home anymore? Yeah, that's a great question. And I think um, probably Paul will have some insight on that as well. But um, 
Uh, firstly, I want to say that LGBTQ youth are pretty adept at um, monitoring their own safety. Um, I think that, and for better or worse, I think that that um, they're pretty. They can. They're they're able to to be, be at, from times of navigating um, whether or not this is a safe environment. Um, they have a they've had opportunities to know that, and I think um, by providing that to them would be the best way to go about doing that. First, I think offering LGBTQ resources um, and support generally um, would really help to not um, to go to go about not outing anyone, and also because you you just really never know who is LGBTQ and who is sort of questioning. I think we often forget about youth who are unsure of questioning and um, may not necessarily feel seen in those resources um, if they're directed. Um, at a particular group of, of youth. Um, and so just sort of um, general resources for anyone um, sort of gets around that issue. But I also think if specific support might be um, wanted or needed, it, it might be worth um, adopting a, a risk assessment, which I, I think sounds um, a little too intense and maybe that might not be the word I'm looking for, but something that just sort of reaches, reaches out to the youth and sort of works with them to sort of come up with a plan um, to gauge whether they feel safe um, to go about getting the support. Um, you know, questions sort of, do your parents monitor your internet history? Um, do you have a private place to talk? Um, would it be best to do this um, video, through video, through text messaging? You know, what's the safest way that we can um, offer support to you? I think just sort of giving that agency to the youth themselves, because again, they know what's the safest for them and what's not. Um, so I just think just coming up with a safety plan and how to go about proceeding with a specific date and time, I think, is the best way to go about doing that. Um, I don't know if that helps or if maybe um, Paul has any additional insight into that. So I think the, the issues around issues of confidentiality is that um, sort of what, what we're trying to tie into. Um, I think uh, particularly with schools, that's an important um, issue to, to keep in mind, especially again, as we're transitioning to remote instruction and maybe maintaining that way of uh, connecting with youth. So for a number of youth, they might not be out to their parents or caregivers. Uh, they might be out to some individuals, but not others. And so if, um, for example, an adult at school is contacting an LGBTQ youth who is out to them, it's important not to assume that they may be around others who know their sexual orientation or gender identity. And so how do we connect with them and have conversations with them with the knowledge that there might be someone next to them, you know, physically next to them, who doesn't know their identities, or as Maisha was saying, uh, might be monitoring their emails or texts. And so how do we just remain vigilant uh, about safeguarding? that. I think the only other thing that comes to my mind has to do with um, instances of bullying and discrimination. A number of schools have um, reporting procedures and part of those reporting procedures often involves contacting parents and it's important not to disempower youth in that process and to check in with youth and to ask them um, if their parents or legal guardians um, are aware of their identities? How can we talk about, you know, this instance in a way that safeguards your privacy or that empowers you um, in terms of how comfortable you feel in coming out, especially if it was an instance of bullying that was actually bias-based harassment? Thank you. Another question coming in is how can we locate schools? How can we locate schools with GSAs in our area? I've noticed many, most, don't publicize the presence or absence of one on their website. So how do we locate them? It's a good question. I think it varies state by state. So for example, in Massachusetts, California, some other states, there are GSA networks in those states that provides this infrastructure to connect schools that have GSAs. And so if they have a website, they oftentimes will um, kind of let you know if there's a GSA at a certain school or you can contact that person, they might be able to connect you with someone. Other schools do have a list of all of their clubs that are at their school. And again, some GSAs may be more GSA equivalents. So they might not be explicitly called gender sexuality alliances. It might be more 
broadly conceived as a diversity club, especially in middle schools and elementary schools, which are starting to increasingly establish GSAs. Um, but they might not be called GSAs in those settings. But those are two ways that um, you might be able to uh, identify some schools with GSAs. So I'm going to rephrase this question, and I hope I asked it correctly. And if the person, if I'm asking it incorrectly, please just chat back in um, the question to me, and I can try to see if I can get this right. So I think during the COVID conversation, we talked about um, the discrimination that um, LGBTQ young people are facing. And I think the question is trying to get at looking at um, API communities, um, specifically um, East Asian LGBTQ youth, um, and hearing um, stereotypes or racial slurs, particularly from the, public, um, the president's public address, um, how that might impact um, these young people. Uh, yeah, I can I can start with that one. That um, I think that relates to something that I was speaking to towards the beginning of the presentation in terms of the um, minority stress model and um, the idea that um, people with multiple um, minority multiple identities can um, fill this uh, fill, have multiple stressors. And I think it's also something that um, Paul alluded to in um, in his talk as well about the idea that we can have compassion. It's not necessarily additive. We can't think of it as sort of like, okay, you had one, now you have two, but um, this sort of influence of multiple things coming at people. Um, and so I think um, definitely what this is, I think that um, people who are experiencing um, stereotypes and, and racial slurs, whether it be people who are in the API community, and if we think about what's happening right now with, um, with the black community and things, and things um, compounded with what's happening with COVID um, and being an LG and being LGBTQ, you can imagine that there's a, a lot of, of factors going into um, mental health and the mental health of, of youth right now. So we have to consider all of that when we think about what we can do to potentially um, reach youth and what issues they may be experiencing at the time and um, things that we should be addressing as we as we um, as we try to reach them, right? And so, so yeah, I think those are all important things to consider. Yeah, I would just I didn't know. add to that, that, um, you know, in the time leading up to the, and following the inauguration of President Trump, the Southern Poverty Law Center put out a, a report widely showing that uh, many youth and teachers were uh, showing, you know, an uptick a notable uptick in um, microaggressions and instances of discrimination at school. Uh, we've seen that just constantly continue. And I know in some of the work that we've done with GSAs, for example, we've, we've asked how GSAs have addressed intersecting uh, forms of oppression. And so, for example, some GSAs uh, shared that they partnered with their school's Black Lives Matter group to do um, you know, a presentation at their school or um, to raise awareness about racism. And so I think that you know, for youth, there's the API youth communities and you know, more broadly ethnic minority communities and immigrant communities are experiencing heightened discrimination and marginalization. They're also partnering and you know, working with one another to speak out against you know, discrimination in their school and community and kind of underscores why groups such as GSAs and other groups are sort of like a space for youth to be able to come together um, to kind of amplify their voice because especially for youth, uh, not all youth have as many outlets as adults and being able to speak out and um, you know be able to participate in, in, in some of these movements and so it's important that that we have these spaces available to them. Yeah I'm actually reminded so of the Yoruba God Alegba where things happen at intersections and so it's when those intersecting identities where you you can experience a lot of your conflict right so you can be black and LGBTQ and you can experience racism you can be trans and all of these things are intersecting and compounding and you're dealing with all of these things at the crossroads at the same time. Um, so the next question um, is that comes 
and says, thank you, Paul, for your presentation. Are there any best practices or resources that you can um, suggest for starting an online GSA at my middle school during distance learning? Um, could you also address the, I think we've kind of addressed this already, um, the confidentiality regarding LGBTQ students participating at home? Um, so that was kind of the first question. So the, 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 the main question that's being asked here that we haven't already addressed is, are there any best practices or resources to start a GSA at their middle school right now during distance learning? You know, offhand, I know that I just checked Listen's website recently and they have a few webinars and uh, videos on starting GSAs and uh, especially how to continue GSA meetings in this time of virtual meetings in Massachusetts where I am. I know that we, you know, we're very fortunate to have a GSA network across the state and so they've really uh, made efforts to continue GSA virtual meetings for youth that aren't specific to a school, but just more broadly across the state. They have a time, um, you know, a way for youth to log on and they facilitate those meetings as a way to just kind of continue that sense of community and connection with peers, uh, you know, virtually. At the same time, uh, the very real concern remains that um, not all youth have access to the internet and aren't able to, to join. Um, they might be using you know, shared uh, laptops or phones and uh, they might not be available to them, they might not be out. And so even though we do see um, some continuation of virtual meetings, we have to be uh, aware that not all youth are able to participate the, in them and the youth who may need those connections most might be those who are unable to join. Um, but that's a start. And, and then I would say, um, you know, with schools in general, sometimes there are schools where uh, you have to have parent permission to be a part of clubs. Um, others, there's not that uh, requirement, but uh, I would first check with GLSEN, and then if there's a GSA network in your state, uh, oftentimes advisors kind of share best practices with one another of how they've been able to kind of balance that confidentiality with kind of the, the rules for that and, and how to kind of describe the club in a, in a more generic way that doesn't inadvertently out any youth to the parents who, who don't feel comfortable with that. Thank you. And just a note, Glisten is one of the partners in this week of action. Uh, so if you joined the webinar yesterday, you heard from Becca, uh, who really leads a lot of their education work. What I can, I'm happy to do is reach out to Becca um, around this GSA conversation and see along with this uh, webinar recording and the, the slides as we upload them, if Becca will um, slide over some of the GSA information and we can um, highlight GLSEN's information in one in one spot. So if you're coming to get the recording and the slides, you can get the link to um, GLSEN's GSA information as well. Um, so happy to slide that. Uh, and then our last question um, for time's sake, uh, Dr. Poteet, how did you validate causation? Um, could it be that empowered youth are more likely to be engaged in GSA? I'm glad that you brought that up. I think that's been a common conversation anecdotally is, uh, among scholars and practitioners is whether youth who are in GSAs are already empowered and doing well and whether GSAs are simply enhancing that um, effect for those youth. What we did is we did baseline assessments at the beginning of the year where we kind of measured youth's mental health concerns, their sense of empowerment on those same measures, and then at the end of the year, we also asked them about that again. And so in our models, we adjusted for what their baseline levels were. So in essence, to not get too technical, but to simply say that essentially, knowing what I knew about where you were at the beginning of the year, you're reporting higher levels of empowerment than I would have expected. And partially the reason for that is because you're reporting greater engagement in your GSA than other youth. So we, we can talk about it in that term, certainly not in terms of causality from an experimental approach. There are a number of other factors that certainly could contribute to greater empowerment among youth, but what we were at least able to show was that GSAs in this instance did contribute in part to that greater level of empowerment toward the end of the year. 
Thank you. Thank you both so much. I know there was one question about um, a slide for the resources. We will go ahead and um, make available these uh, slides on the website and so that you can get the information that was shared today. Uh, the recording takes about 24 hours just for us to get um, from Zoom, downfall from Zoom, um, but we will also upload um, the recording information to the same place where you went to register for these uh, webinars, the slides plus any resources and the recordings will all be featured right there. Uh, please help me thank our panelists. Thank you so much for all of your hard work uh, and bringing this information to us today. For those of you who are joining tomorrow, the, the webinar part of the series is focused on policies. I'm a bit of a policy wonk, so I'm looking forward to that one. We will take a look at the, um, the attacks that happened against LGBTQ young people across the country at the state legislative session. We'll also dive deep into the South Carolina lawsuit, which now allows for um, LGBTQ young people to be mentioned and reflected in the sex ed curricula. So a big win in South Carolina. We'll have the um, key litigator who was part of that lawsuit uh, joining us next uh, tomorrow. Uh, so if you're interested, sign up. Uh, register for that webinar, and we will see you all tomorrow. Thank you all so much. Have a good day. Bye. Thank you for having us.